I'm Nigel Swaby. My company is Scots & Co. That's the Scots & Co. catalogue and online business, as well as six other businesses that are very similar. Um, do you remember the days when you used to go into a meeting and say, please excuse my casual attire? Well, please excuse my formal attire today, but uh, I was inspired by a chap called Christopher Nieper, who was uh, training on this platform a couple of days ago. And there he was in his beautiful pink tie and his gray suit. And I thought, well, he does look smart, he looks splendid. So I thought, why not? I haven't put a suit on in two years, so please excuse my attire. Um, what I'm going to try to do um, in the next um, 25 minutes is to try to summarize developments over the past four months. Um, and I'm trying to look at things in a sort of a yin and yang way. That is, here are the challenges and what are the solutions? because there are plenty of challenges, but equally there are lots of opportunities. So um, let's, let's start from that place. But what is that place? You know, where are we? I mean, I mean and there's an example. Don't you just hate that, that statement? We are where we are. Um, I immediately hear in my ear a, a politician, um, rather like, uh, what's his name, Pontius Pilate, washing his hands saying, well, I'm not responsible for where we are now, but." Uh, nor am I quite sure whether I'm responsible for what's coming up. You know, we are where we are. It's, it's that sort of resigned sort of approach. I absolutely do dislike that. Um, and as direct marketers, of course, um, we can't use that excuse because the trail of events behind us is of our doing. In other words, we're entirely responsible for what we've created in terms of market circumstances. Um, so we, we just can't, we, we don't have any platitudes to hide behind. Um, and it's really important, therefore, to be honest with oneself, um, particularly because you learn more from the mistakes, as you all know, than you do from your successes. And, um, and in that same vein, let me start by giving you a, a challenge. Um, you'll all be aware of it, at least anyone who's in, in the business will be aware of it. Uh, and I'll tell you what I did in reaction to it, which was the wrong thing. Um, about the second week in July, uh, we were all thinking, well, isn't it great? The response is still way up, not quite as high as July 2020, but still holding up to within 10% of July 2020 levels. And then in the second week, bang, all response fell off a cliff, and not just for Scots or the, uh, the, the six other businesses, it was right the way across the board through all of our competitors, I've spoken to all of them, and they all said, yep, second week in July, it just dropped like a stone. And well, let's be specific, it dropped by about 20 to 30%. Some people have reported 30% drop week on week um, or relative to what they're expecting. And so you might ask, well, what were they expecting? Um, most of us had taken the pandemic, the, you know, the peak pandemics of responses, uh, and had shaved those down by 10 or even 20%, or well, we suddenly found that we were 20% under that. Um, and, you know, what does one do in that sort of situation? Well, um, in our case, uh, we decided that our famous check that we issue once a month or once every two months to our customers for about 12 pounds, it normally has a threshold of 50 pounds you have to spend to spend the, uh, the check. We said, let's have no threshold. We'll get a lot more response uh, we'll have a few people who will abuse it, a few, uh, and, um, and let's just do it because we need to stimulate demand. Um, that decision probably cost us 150, maybe 200,000 pounds because yes, we did have a lot of abusers. We'd done it the year before and we'd seen 30 or 40,000 pounds worth of what we call abuse. In other words, thank you for my 12 pound check. Here's my 13 pounds order <laughs> and they get free goods. They have to pay for, for their postage and packing charge within that. Um, but it was a, a major error because what it did is it took our average order value, which is normally around 80 pounds, down to 53. Um, and that's really serious, as we all know, because the cost of order processing, let's call it four pounds, is, is the same whether it's a 100 pound order or a 10 pound order or a 15 pound order. But in terms of your profit and loss account, four pounds on 10 pounds is whoops, 40%. Um, whereas four pounds on hundred is four percent, so you lose margin points uh, when your average order value goes down. We will never do that again, and I've reminded all my colleagues to remind me if I ever say that we should do that again. 
let's let's move on to another big challenge and it's the one of the moment well there's one even more current but uh, shipping costs the the raw raw facts here are that uh, 40 foot high cube container this time last year was costing under $2,000. Uh, it's now $20,000. So 10 times up. And it doesn't finish there because um, as the containers were coming across um, in the early part of this year, sort of March, April, May, um, so we were still in a mess as a result of Brexit and the shipping lines were deciding to divert ships to Rotterdam. Why? Because the documentation delays in British ports were such that they couldn't have, afford to have their ships just sitting outside over the, over to uh, Rotterdam they went. And then of course they had to be transshipped. So that after tremendous delays at the factories in the Far East, you then had tremendous delays in Europe. And then when they come in, uh, you then got the lorry driver delay, but in hard cash terms, that meant demurrage, which can run at 60, 80 pounds a day on a container and very quickly builds up to thousands of pounds Normally, it would take two or three days to clear through. It was taking 10, and it still is taking 10 to 14 days sometimes to get through customs. Um, but it doesn't end there because your container comes into your warehouse, you empty it, you send it back to the port, and you get detention charges. Why? Because there aren't enough ships to take away the containers. So you arrive at a situation where a, a lovely set of garden furniture for which you paid $70 FOB at your, your factory in the Far East ends up uh, collecting $120 or $150 in freight charges. So your freight is one to two times the cost of the goods. So, um, but let's go back on the positive uh, very quickly because that is a nightmarish scenario. It only applies to the really big items. So action number one is focus in on smaller items. Action number two is pivot towards UK and Europe as your sources, because with those, costs you know there, it's just not sustainable um action number three is more remedial of one's uh, state of of depression and that is everybody's in the same boat so prices are going to go up um and you know there, there's no question of someone being able to get a competitive advantage and being able to ship containers at you know five thousand dollars it's just not available it is eighteen to twenty thousand dollars um but um the, the, the there are other things you can do apart from increasing prices. Um, um, you just need to take a positive approach to it and, and start being selective. Just favor the very small items because freight is a very small part of your total cost on those. Um, and then how about this? Uh, you might have seen it back in February. I talked about it endlessly. Uh, the Telegraph publishes an article saying um, catalogs are dead um, and gives as an example the uh, um, IKEA, the Argos catalogue, the Next catalogue, the other mail order catalogues, you know, gone are the days of mail order. It's rubbish, um, but it was repeated in the Retail Gazette under the headline, is this the end for catalogues? Um, and even some of my uh, favorite catalogue pundits in the States, people like Kevin Hillstrom and uh, <coughs> um, Bill Lapierre, are predicting doom and gloom about the future of catalogs, particularly as papers become difficult to secure. Um, but my response um, to each of them is, well, if catalogs are dead, why did we double our volume of catalogs mailed in 2020? And why are we in 2021 increasing that by another 31%? Uh, 31 is far too precise. It'll be around 30. Um, and, and, and the answer is because it is profitable to do so. Um, what we've done during the pandemic is we've looked very closely at the true costs of um, each channel um, when correctly attributing the orders. And that we'll come on to that this afternoon, the whole question of how you attribute the orders which come in, which are source unknown. We call them bucket orders. How do you, do you attribute those between the channels? But let's not go there. The, the, the focus at the moment is this, this, this tendency to, to convince everyone on, on the part of the journalists that catalogs are dead. Well, we've started fighting back um, and we're, we're fighting back by pointing out as politely as we can that not all catalogs are the same and that yes, of course they're right, that the big tomes are dead. Um, who wants to send a big catalog full of gardening equipment 
to someone who lives in a flat or a big catalog that can that contains baby clothes to a, a couple who are in their 70s um it's just imprecise and what you've got and what you've had for the past 10 years is this more agile more versatile uh form of uh catalog which is far more vibrant uh and dynamic and that can be mailed um very very effectively um i explained all this to um a journalist called louise eccles and if you want to cheer yourself up find a copy of last week's sunday times and under the heading um catalogs are cool uh louise has explained the difference between the big catalogs and the small catalogs we've been feeding the information both both and, and we have been feeding lots of information I'm, i would have loved her to have carried more information about scots i think we got a tiny paragraph but that's not the point the point was that she went on to explain that no um this is a fantastic way of supporting your retail stores and supporting particularly your website there's johnny bowden saying i don't like catalogs I, they're darn expensive but we absolutely need them because people when they get their catalog they then go online and place their order using their catalog it's a far more cost effective way of presenting uh, lots of merchandise um now we've still got a problem of course because um the problem of the moment literally of this week is that um we are facing some substantial headwinds in paper costs and print costs so last week um one of our printers one of our larger printers came through and said well as of i think it was november the first we're increasing all your prices by 10 percent. we're really sorry but energy costs have risen by that much um and we thought whoa what's going to happen with paper and then we had a very large we deal with a number of big paper mills uh we're buying uh, six thousand tons of paper a year and uh they just came through and they said well uh, um we need to because of increased costs we need to increase our our prices and we said yes so please give us details they took two days to get it together they come back with 36 percent increases um now given that paper is 65 percent of the cost of your package when it mails uh that's really serious um but again i can find plenty to um to be optimistic about in that um the cup half full version is that well that's the opening gambit in a negotiation there are other paper mills we know that some of them are not as aggressive as 36 percent uh we do like their paper we will have to compromise on the quality of our paper but then that's the second point we will uh down, downgrade if you like uh never like to do it but we'll downgrade the uh the cost of the weight of our paper particularly the weight because we all know that if you put a beautiful cover on a catalog um you can disguise the look of it it looks beautiful as long as your paper inside your text paper is not too gray you can run down to 50 45 maybe even 40 grams as your paper weight um the other thing i think we've got to do in the face of that sort of increase is start thinking about making catalogs feel more precious to our customers now <clears throat> the way that we've tackled that at scots is to say right we have a, a master edition which is 148 pages or 144 and we have the more commercial or agile um smaller format catalog so i don't know how we're going to do it yet but uh, whether we emphasize the fact that if you want to continue to receive the full master edition which only goes to uh, members you do have to spend this amount um but in practical terms we we mail the big catalog to our best customers because they respond better and you get an overall a, a much higher yield let's say eight thousand nine thousand pounds per thousand catalogs you send out so very very good return um but by contrast when you get down towards the more marginal element of your file and cold and prospects and reactivated customers you need something more agile and royal mail's best rates are available on letter format why because they can machine them fast through their big machines um and so one needs to start thinking in terms of recruitment catalogs which are absolutely optimized uh and the the, the larger catalog which is for your members um we've only got five minutes left i see or seven minutes left so i'd better hurry up because there's so many things to cover but talking of royal mail i've got to say that i'm 
I'm astonished that so many of my colleagues in the industry are still mailing in a suboptimal way. They're not using MailMark, they're using Poly, um, they're not using envelopes and, um, and paper wraps, which allow you to access the sustainable mail rates, which will soon be withdrawn, but uh, other discounts are being um, introduced. There are, I mean, when I saw the prices increasing in April uh, on Royal Mail, I was concerned because we'd had a very good year. And what had happened is, is because Royal Mail, clever as they are, they actually decided to reduce their prices to try to maintain their volume. What it enabled us to do was to search out all sorts of new packets of data which we could mail. And as a result of the success of some of those mailings, we've now identified um, new places to go for recruitment. And so that's why we can still increase our mailing quantities by 30% this year. So it was a smart move. When I looked at April's, this April's uh, increases, I thought, well, that looks pretty bad. But then I ran the numbers and I found it was only 10, 15 pounds more than the previous year per thousand. And um, it's, it's still holding good. When they finally turn off the juice, as it were, I think we may have a problem, but let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, I think the uh, the other issue that I'd love to cover very briefly um, is, is probably the most important issue of all, and that is that many of you, um, many companies in the catalog online retail business are uh, doing their maths incorrectly. Um, digital advertising is fantastic, isn't it? You know, it's low cost. You don't have to print all that paper. But is it actually fantastic? Um, what are the ROAS figures that you're achieving? If you look carefully, you'll find and if you allow for the fact that, you know, there can be many touch points on any response that comes in on your website, you may find that you're overcounting. And we have, um, we've taken a, a very sort of numbers driven approach to this. What we've appreciated is that online customers spend less than half what a customer does if they're required by direct mail. So they're ordering less often and their order values are lower. Um, the way that that translates through is at less than half the lifetime value. So that's not so good, but it, it doesn't stop there. Um, we've got the situation where if you look at, um, sorry, I'm distracted by Karen coming in um, and giving me five minutes. Um, if you look at the, 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 whole, the, the whole picture in a, in a more holistic sense, what you've got is um, direct mail is scalable, digital we find is not. On a good mailing, small format, recruitment mailing, we can pull in 30,000 customers in the space of new customers in the space of six weeks. And we know they're new customers. It's not like inserts, which are now horribly unreliable in the press, where your existing customers respond which is kind of disastrous because you want them to respond to your main catalog. No, on a targeted mailing, you know that all new customers. So that new stream of customers, 30,000, can be acquired either at a profit or at a very, very small loss of one or two pounds per thousand. By contrast, if I want to pull 30,000 customers on, in on digital channels, I'm probably going to have to spend 300,000 pounds. They're going to cost me 10 pounds a customer. And in fact, uh, this is very much of the moment. I went to a conference 10 days ago, which was entitled, is there an alternative to digital advertising? We see the costs soaring at the present time. What can we do? Um, and there were 40 or so, um, mostly pure dot-com players in the room, desperate to hear of uh, alternatives. And uh, they were probably very irritated to hear our comparisons of the value for money that you get in digital, in insert advertising, in TV, and in direct mail because direct mail as uh, sort of online marketing may be great uh, digital advertising may be great but uh, direct mail is much better it's much more effective it's much cheaper and it's scalable you can get real volume into it um i need to maybe choose one last subject to cover i've got about four or five here but we've always got time later today to talk um i think that why not why don't i give you a, a true another true confession they're all for, always fun january the 22nd uh this year um scotts and co suffered a hacking attack 
good old ransomware attack. Now, people don't talk about this because a lot of corporates will not let their marketing directors mention this because the great fear is that the ICO will believe that there might be a data breach. Well, in our case, there wasn't a data breach. We checked that there had been no packets going out and they didn't even get access to our customer file. It was just an old gold fashioned stick em up. Um, it, they made a ransom demand, which was for a few thousand. We decided to not to make any immediate payment. Uh, we started building uh, a server from scratch, what they call a, a bare metal um, reconstruction. Um, the attack itself probably immediately cost us 10 grand. The knock on effect, three or 400,000 pounds off our bottom line. Um, but here's the, here's the joke in it. The hackers, the ransomware ha attackers, posted a note on our websites saying, well, you may come to thank us in a few years time because this is an early warning and it's not gonna cost you much. Um, it just shows you how penetrable your, your files, your, your servers were. Um, you now need to do some homework. And they they were actually, I was furious when I read that, but uh, they're actually right. We're now, we've now upgraded our security. We've run endless penetration tests and it's convinced me that we need to go up to the cloud for, with all our business systems, all our storage, apart from our database, which, you know, like Fort Knox is going to be locked away somewhere very safe. And so I can even find um, an upside in the 30 minutes that, um, sorry, the, I just had, I love that, in the 30, um, I had two minutes put in front of me. Um, and again, it's uh, distracting me. So um, I could go on. Um, it's time for just one last one. There's a chap called Don Libby. Do you remember him? He used to sit on the board of Scots, uh, probably the, the top consultant of our industry in the last 20 years. The Chinese are coming, he said, at the conference like this in the UK 12 years ago. Well, they've come now. What can we do about it? All we can do about it is, until the government acts is we can uh, brand our products so that they're not um, uh, imitable, inimitable not subject to imitation by Far East suppliers, and we can innovate.